Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides. From those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. In Abney Park Cemetery, North London, there is an unusual gravesite, a sleeping lion a memorial to Frank C. Bostock. Frank was a showman who toured with exotic animals throughout Europe. In 1893, he moved to America and connected the masses with these amazing creatures. He is credited as being the first person to bring a pet lion to the U.S. Frank was known to have been mauled several times, which is thought to have contributed to his early death in 1912 at the age of 46. Was this where the owning of great cats as pets began in the U.S. and continues to this day? And as you can see here, this little pet, Squeaky the Lion, makes a wonderful house pet. The danger factor is always there with these large feline pets, as this old clip shows. Watching it is a little unsettling, but it isn't enough to stop more and more people seeking the unusual as a pet. Animals are family. And it doesn't matter if it's a tiny little house cat or, you know, a lion or tiger or a bear, you have that connection with animals regardless of size. When I was young, I used to think I could save the world. And I was always dragging home misfits and I worked at a veterinary clinic for a while and don't put the dog to sleep, I'll find him a home. Jill Carnegie's passion to save animals has become a lifelong mission. But her focus is not just about rehoming the neighborhood dog. In the town of Sharon, Wisconsin, the Valley of the King Sanctuary is home to a large variety of exotic animals. Abused, abandoned, retired, and injured, these large pets aren't for the faint-hearted. And for Jill, having a rebellious streak has led her to this amazing work. When I was a child, I was always dragging things home and getting into trouble. Um, my mother hates animals. She's 96 years old, she's still alive. And um, we had many, many discussions about animals and I ended up getting married young when I was 17 to basically get out of the house. And I married um, a guy because he had a horse, which is really stupid, but, uh, <laughs> And then we ended up here. I, I divorced him in 96 and then remarried Jim, who loves animals as much as, as I do. We've been married 20 years now. Jill and Jim are dedicated to looking after the welfare of their animals. Sanctuaries are common in the US, so there's a need to rehome. In captivity, big cats have been known to attack humans with devastating results. This horrific scene is testament to what can go wrong. A man trying to feed a couple of circus animals finds out the hard way that a tiger is a predator and one that can strike at any time. The defense is a couple of wooden poles, but the man struggles to save his hand. From minor injuries to permanent disability and even death, it's never wise to assume a big cat is a tame animal, no matter where you might find it. 
In Jill's sanctuary, there's no crossing of the boundaries, even if one of their residents was once a family pet. This is Janie, she's grumpy. She hasn't been here very long. She's from a lady in Texas who has cancer and she couldn't care for her. She was a pet and she actually adored the lady. She's still adjusting. It'll take her time. The interesting thing is I can come out and she's, she's fine with me. I can give her treats and talk to her and she rolls over and I don't go in with her. I wouldn't trust her. She's actually a very sweet cat. She just doesn't like a lot of people. She feels threatened. And um, she's got to adjust living with a few girls down here, which she's not crazy about. So um, eventually she'll have a buddy when we get a male lion in. And then we do vasectomies because we don't believe in breeding. So she'll, then she'll be happy. <laughs> This was someone's pet. They lived in Florida. She is about 17 years old, and she's been here ever since she's been about five. She lived in their house till she was about four or five years old, and um, she had the run of their backyard. And then they had to move, and no place would allow them to have their lion. Well, come on, come on, there we go. What a good tiger. <laughs> You're such a good tiger. He's one of the biggest tigers we have, but we have one that's even larger. And he's 17, so he's not a youngster by any stretch. But he's been here since he was four months old. He was somebody's pet in Big Bed, Wisconsin. They bought him illegally from a breeder in Arizona. And then they realized when he was about four months old that the furniture and the kids were not safe. And so they did the right thing and brought him out. And then they said, we will never get another exotic again. So thank God for that. He's probably at least, I would put him 11, 1200 pounds easily. Yeah, he's massive. There is no doubt Kubla is one very large animal, and with that size comes a big appetite. Tigers rely primarily on sight and sound for hunting. They will see you long before you have any idea they've been sizing you up. The tiger can consume almost 100 pounds of meat at a time. Large prey are no barrier. Even if you've been working with your trained cats for decades, you can never trust a tiger. It only takes one shocking moment to change your life to near death, as this Spanish circus trainer found out during the performance. Kubla doesn't have to go on the prowl for anything but more affection. And with Jill around, that's a given. He's an absolute love bug. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. But you always have to remember that they're trained and never tamed. They are who they are, and even a good one can cause serious harm. So you just don't want to Especially the older I get, I guess I get smarter too. <laughs> yeah, we always take tons and tons of precautions. And in 44 years, we've never had an injury, never had an escape, never had anything happen. Knock on wood. And everything that's come in as babies get huge like this, I think because we feed every day, we don't believe in fasting them. And they get an enormous amount of calcium and vitamins and absolutely everything that they need, where a lot of private people don't have a clue what the animals should get. We've gotten cougars in with rickets, um, others with broken bones, and just all kinds of horrible things. 
So Zoo will take ground meat, put it on a little platter, slide it under and take it away. So they don't have anything to chew on and then maybe one day they'll give them bones. So they can chew on a bone. But the zoo cats that we've gotten in have had uh, slab fractures, really bad teeth that our vets have had to put to back together again. These guys, that ones that have come in when they're young that we've raised, even when they're senior citizens and we knock them out, their teeth are absolutely pristine because they get everything that they need, the hide, the bone, um, just everything. Plus they get supplements. Jill feels right at home with these enormous cats. These are her adored pets. But when the need arose, she took a big step out of her comfort zone to start welcoming large Syrian grizzlies to the sanctuary. So gentle, yeah. Which, at first, I was like, grizzly bears? I don't think so. And when I saw them and how gentle they were, I'm like, okay, this could be doable. Jill's not at ease with these enormous bears, but is growing to like having them around. However, choosing to hang out with these massive predators inside the cage, knowing they're capable of suddenly turning on anyone, isn't a choice for most of us. Is this bravery or a death wish? Bears are aggressive. Camping in their territory is a risk to you and your property. And yet, many people have these same bears living in their homes. Deaths from bear attacks are rare in the U.S. On average, three people per year are taken, which makes the odds of being killed very small. But does this risk increase with more exposure? While Jill devotes her life to caring for her pets, there also comes that heartbreaking time when you need to say goodbye. We hold the record for the oldest living felid in the world, and that was Sammy. He lived to be 36 years old, a purebred Sumatran tiger. And he was a little butterball the day we put him to sleep, sadly, but his hips gave out. So when the quality of life is gone, then it's, it's time for them. We cremate all of our big cats and our other animals. That way no one can dig them up 100 years from now and get them. I'm like King Tut with the grave, so. <laughs> this is Huggy. This is the one that I have to put to sleep, but it's, it's really killing me. He's an old man. He's in multiple organ failure. But it's his time. He's 22 years old. It's, it's heartbreaking, even though you know it, it's the right thing to do, you know. This time next week, he'll probably be passed on to Rainbow Bridge. Yeah, but I'm going to miss him. I will absolutely miss him terribly. It's really hard. I have a lot of favorites that are buried here. I had lost my son in um, 1998 in a car accident. And he's buried here, and this is where Jim and I will be buried as well, because we want to be with those we love. I don't want to be in a human cemetery, it just doesn't feel right. I love the elderly and I, and I love the misfits. That's really where my heart is. And when a cat is old and senile, they forget they eat. So you feed them and 10 minutes later, they're like, hello, I didn't eat today. And you got to give them some more. And um, that goes on all day. <laughs> Jill is a seasoned conservationist. Her motivation is about rescue. It's so amazing. When they're rescued, they're completely different than one you've raised as a kid. They are so grateful. And the exotics are exactly the same way because we loaded these animals up and they know they're going to a better place instantly. This certainly is a better place with superior conditions than where these animals have come from. For Lena and her mate, Thena, their lives have improved remarkably. And we have a little crippled tiger here. This is one of my favorites. This is Lena. She came out of the same seizure in Indiana, and the SWAT team was there. They had all their long guns, and uh, it was pretty scary. Here she comes. 
There she comes. And as you can see, her knees are really bad. Hi. The way she walks. Hi, little pumpkin. Hi, how are you? This cat and this other cat over here, they lived in circus roll crates. Six foot by four foot, maybe five foot, their entire lives. They were in a dark barn, no light. We had to use bolt cutters to open all the locks because it had been ever since they were just prisoners in those little areas. When Lena came, she would sit and she could kind of paddle around like this on her feet and then she'd do this like stargazing. And now as you can see, she can run and she can play. And um, our vet is amazed that she gets around as well as she did because it was not expected at all. But she probably will never live to see old age because of her handicap. But for the time that we have with her, you know, we'll do anything and everything for her. But this owner that, that owned this cat, it was, it was horrific. He was an older circus mentality kind of person. And then once a year, he'd roll the wagons out for the neighborhood kids to see and then roll them back into their dark barn. He would take a stick and just scoop the poop out and it, all over the floor in there it was awful. It's probably one of the worst seizures that we've ever been on. It was absolutely horrific. This is the other one that came with Lena um, that lived in a circus roll crate. Yeah, this is Thena. She was very young to begin with. When we got her, she's about 18 months old. So she wasn't left in that condition. So like this one was for six years to become neurotic, but most of the neurotic behaviors is gone now, which is great. But she doesn't seem to have been scarred at all as far as, you know, being abused like that. She's really got a cute personality. She's very outgoing. She does have broken teeth from grabbing the, the bars where she lived. And she was really thin when she came. He's so sweet. But even though he's got hybrid in him, you can't trust them. They have a switch because they've got the wolf in them. But he's a very sweet boy. He loves his attention. He loves his cuddles. Yeah, you're a good boy. We lost his sister to cancer when she was three. Hi, Milo. I think he's eight or nine. And it's very interesting because um, we have a couple volunteers that he hates and he will actually charge the fence to eat them. Yes, it's amazing. I mean, like he knows you guys are all animal people. What a good boy. Like many homes, there's often a need for renovations and the Valley of the King Sanctuary is no different. Nestled on 10 acres of farmland, the sanctuary was established more than 30 years ago. And as more funding comes through, the better the conditions become for these majestic creatures. If every sanctuary in America did not have big cats and was empty and they had a place to go, that would be my dream. I would tell you, if we could buy the property that surround us, I would give them, if we had the money, two, three, four, five acre pens. That would be the ultimate. It'd be awesome. The interesting thing is, is when they come from an area that they have a, a small pen and you give them a larger pen, they're so happy and content with what they have because they've never had a large area. The one lion that was kept in a roll, circus roll crate her entire life, we just moved her to the big area up um, in the compound and she didn't know what to do. She would stay in the small area and she would kind of look around. She wouldn't play with her toys. She wouldn't roar or vocalize. And it took her about two weeks to figure out, okay, so I can go over here and oh my gosh, I can go over there too. And oh, there's a toy. And now she's playing and acting like a normal animal. So it's kind of like um, you have to, to get inside of their heads to kind of rearrange their thinking that, okay, it's okay to have that much room. Jill and her husband are very committed to ensuring their beautiful animals have a great second chance to a much improved life. You come to the point you can't save them all. It's not humanly possible. But if everybody took care of their own backyard, 
and did what they could that the world would truly be a better place. So everyone who comes through our gates, we make a lifetime commitment to, and they're here forever through thick and thin and illness and whatever. And I know that the time that we need to let them go, that they had a good life for the time that they had with us. Well, yeah, I get bitten every day. Well, probably not every day, but once a week. And that's because I breed pythons. I breed young snakes that, that are, are harmless. Pythons don't have any venom. Some snakes may be technically venomous, but not that bad. So I've had a few bites that I don't count. If you get to the pointy end, I've had four intensive care visits. So four times the word's been a bit touch and go. Every time there's something I did wrong, yes. And when you do something over and over, sometimes it's complacency sets in. Just how close would you get to a snake to feel the snake's body slithering against your skin? Even experienced snake handlers, like this one in Cyprus, who removed the snake from the neighbor's backyard, can run into a problem. Yes? Yes. <laughs> The adrenaline factor is huge, but the consequences can make for a very bad day. However, when you're performing for a crowd, it's all about the showmanship. This one here is a tiger snake and potentially very, very lethal if it bit you. Because this one's captive bred and it's used to me and I've never given it any reason to bite me. It's never, it's not, snakes aren't designed just to bite for no reason. If it did, it would be, yeah, a bad day. It's potentially one of the most lethal land snakes in the world. He won't just bite you. This is the misconception. He doesn't want to bite you to get away. So often you won't get a warning, you'll hear a rustle in the bush and that's him already getting away. 80% of our hospitalised bites, people trying to catch and kill the snake. It's simple. People think they're dangerous and because they've got to deal with this dangerous animal and they deal with it by getting the shovel, trying to kill it, and then they realise how quick and agile these animals are when it's too late. Australian Gary Davies has had a fascination with snakes since he was five years old. He knew he wanted to be a snake man. Over the years, he gathered a collection of the most venomous, including the tiger snake, king brown, and death adder. Add to that a few different species of pythons and lizards, and you've got a rather uncommon assortment of pets. For Gary, this passion for reptiles has led to a career working with snakes and educating the public. But quite frankly, it seems Gary prefers snakes to humans. Look, honestly, what a man and his snake do in the privacy of their own snake shed is a different story. Uh, but in public, I don't go handling snakes in order like this. It's just to show you that they are not, you know, red hot killers that are out to get us. Naturally, I'm not his prey. Tiger snakes are far from violent or uh, aggressive animals. In fact, if you're going to learn snakes, tiger snakes and king browns are one of the most quietest, easily chilled snakes of the venomous snakes there are. If you're new to snakes, perhaps starting with a couple of Australia's most venomous isn't for the beginner. They may be laid back and chilled out, but you don't want to be surprising them. You keep within boundaries. I'm not doing anything to cause this snake to actually bite me. Um, and he is close, getting close to full grown now. But it's not about size. Venom, it doesn't come down to size with venom. You know, you need a mil, a mil of venom. It doesn't matter how big the snake is. So it's not like, oh, he's too big to handle, no. That one there is, it's gonna give you, you know, a bad day as bad as anything on the planet can, as far as venom, you know. I don't recommend it as a pet. If you want to like snakes, there's a whole lot of uh, less toxic snakes, you know, safer snakes to keep. But if tiger snakes are your thing and you've got to that stage, then, then great, you know, I'm all for it. But I just don't suggest it for someone thinking about a pet snake. No, don't think of a tiger snake. Don't think of a venomous snake. 
I think keeping venomous snake is something you evolve to and you get to rather than trying to aspire to. If you're thinking a tiger snake might be off the pet list, after all, it is one of the top three most venomous land snakes in Australia, then you may be interested in the King Brown. It comes in much lower on the danger scale, at around number six. This is a King Brown. <laughs> Particularly huge for a King Brown. Might not be able to hold up. But it is a venomous snake that's very, very active. Yeah, he's going to be a lot more active. He wasn't captive bred. He was actually wild caught under licence. But he has got used to me and that I don't hurt him, so he's in the process of calming down very well. But it is a process thing where I, this one I won't um, give the same sort of luxuries as I would that tiger snake. It's just understanding your own animal again. Um, he can turn around and bite, but he's slowly learning since he's been caught that, oh, well, this guy's not too bad. If you're a snake in captivity, you don't get to choose your owner. But Gary is a role model for responsible pet ownership. For one, he's a reptile feeder, so he'll feed on other snakes. He's pretty good at catching and killing, overpowering even death adders, other venomous snakes. So I'd never keep him together with another snake, especially if he's hungry. Great tip for the uninitiated, it pays to do your research. Snake ownership is serious business. There's a lot to learn in order to stay safe. The King Brown is the largest member of the black snake family, so he's not actually a brown snake. But because he's often brown in colour, they've called him the King Brown. The other name is Mulga Snake, which is probably a better name. If you got bitten by this, you'd need black snake antivenom, not brown snake. They're very widespread, so they're found right throughout the whole of Australia, um, except for the very southeast and the very southwest. Now, a big one of these can push three metres, and that's probably the Kimberley forms. The ones in the Kimberley are the biggest. And you grab one of them by the tail in the wild, you know you've got a snake when he's three metres long. A snake that big and with the name King Brown, that's where he gets these reputation from them. Everything that happens, people talk about, oh, do you hear about the King Brown? And these are stories that have been exaggerated because it sounds such an aggressive animal, it sounds so big. Yes, it's that perception of deadliness. It's, it can be dangerous, but, um, Again, I think we carry the legends a lot more than the actual reality uh, deserves. If they're not natural predators, they're gonna bite out of fear. Now you can break down that fear. Uh, they're not scared of you so much. There's no reason for them just to bite randomly. Fear is quite possibly the number one reason why you would be bitten. If you see a snake sliding through the bush or accidentally step on one, there's a really good chance you're going to panic and perhaps end up in the hospital. Even with all of Gary's experience, he's admitted to a few close calls. I've been handling venomous snakes for well over 25 years. Anytime you get bitten, it's because you've crossed a line. You've been complacent. And hopefully that brings you down to earth and you see your mistake or else you're just gonna make it again. There's always an adrenaline rush when, like you said, you know it can go wrong in a second. You've got to be dead if you don't get adrenaline out of that. You hold a tiger snake like this, I mean, you've got to be dead if you don't get some sort of adrenaline rush. But that's not the right reason to keep them, to keep them for the beauty of the animal. You're working with these animals, you've got to have the understanding there's certain lines you don't cross. You've got to respect that potential risk. There has to be a knowledge of it and an understanding that if I make a mistake here, this is going to end badly for me. There's a hot zone. So while you're in that hot zone, while you're in a hot zone, that's where the potential is. You stay out of that and you're quite, you know, he's not lurking, waiting for you. Well, not if you're a good keeper. If you lose them around the house and they're just lurking somewhere, you don't know. But a good keeper with snakes, he's got an enclosure where he lives and, you know, you know when it's, uh, you're in a dangerous position and that's when you've got to be switched on. Owning any pet that is considered a little unusual often comes with risks, risks that can be fatal. But it can be an adventure for the seasoned, unusual pet lover. You can potentially keep one as a pet, but you have to show the authorities, take the right steps before they deem that you're safe enough to keep one. 
I, I would never suggest anyone keeping king browns or tiger snakes unless they've kept snakes for a long time and they actually know quite a bit about venomous snakes. You can only really learn that by experience. But uh, the adventure side is getting out there in, in the scrub and actually finding these animals. And that's my passion, uh, finding king browns in the field, in the wild, and watching what they do. And that's where our learning comes from, you know. So I guess that's my passion, but everyone's different. If you're convinced you're ready to proudly own a pet snake, then moving to a non-venomous variety is a great place to start. Although they can still be a bit of a handful. Meet Bob. He's an older python. His name's Bob. But I've had him about 14 years from, from birth. He's been around people his whole life. He works with kids and in crowds, and often if I'm standing close to someone who's holding him, he will come over to me. And he doesn't love me, I have no, no doubt. He doesn't love me and has an affection for me, but I'm a familiar scent to him, just like if he had a, um, a hollow log in the wild that's a familiar place, it's a familiar scent. Bob is likely to reach a maximum length of four and a half to five meters. But all of pythons have been known to get up to six and a half meters or more. That's a lot of snake to keep your eye on. Me and Bob, often there's things that happen around the house that people would think strange. I'm making a sandwich with him around my neck. Seems strange to some people, I guess. It's quite normal around my house. I guess sometimes people think of um, pets as something that you can cuddle and grab hold of. Now, to me, not necessarily true. You know, you don't have to pat an animal, you can still have a pet and just enjoy it for what it is. And I think that maybe that's a line that some people call, call some things a pet because they can cuddle it at night and give it a hug. Some animals don't necessarily want to be hugged, um, but does that make them not a pet? If you're looking after them, you keep an animal in captivity and you give it all its needs and you look after it and it's a healthy animal and you get enjoyment out of it, then to me that's a pet. You've got to have respect, and they can be dangerous, but there's so many things in this world that can be dangerous, you know? Some people get married, God, you know, that's danger there. <laughs> you know, each to their own, really. <laughs> Some people think that reptiles are easy, especially snakes, easy pets to keep, and I don't like that attitude, because you think you're going to get a pet because it's easy to keep, then that's probably the wrong reason to get them. They can be easy once you understand their, their needs, but sometimes their needs aren't as simple as people think. You know, most, a lot of people think, oh, you just keep them warm. Well, keeping them warm, you can kill them by overheating them. I do what I love. Since I was five years old, I loved snakes. So if I could turn my life into snakes, that's what I did. But again, it comes down to some people keep it just for their own ego, especially when it comes down to, well, predator pets or, or things that are potentially dangerous. Often the person's keeping it just to say, look at me, you know, and I think that's the wrong sort of person. And often they're the ones that make mistakes. And in this game, the problem becomes ours because someone keeps things for a wrong reason. If they get bitten by a tiger snake, they make the news. And there's knee-jerk reactions that come to the rest of the hobby. Everyone that keeps these animals has to get affected by the weakest few. So to me, I always believe that people, if they want to keep venomous snakes particularly, as long as they know what they're doing and they, they are doing it for the right reasons, um, not just to be tough or look at me, because that's just going to end wrong sooner or later. People see these cats on Disney films, you know, oh, they all look all friendly and I want one of those. And what happens? They get one and oh dear, it, it, it attacks me. <laughs> it's destroyed my house. Oh, I don't want it anymore. That's the pet side. But then a number of these private breeders are doing the job properly. Dr. Terry Moore knows cats. In fact, he loves cats so much, he has devoted his life to ensuring the survival of a wide number of species. But don't be fooled by the fact that Terry is in the enclosure with this Temex golden cat. These cats are quick and can attack. However, in the right hands, they can be mostly controlled. And there's the African golden cat, which is much more orange than Keeping cats in captivity, there's the pluses and the minuses. If they're doing it properly, and there are a lot of private breeders in this country that we work with, 
A lot of the private breeders work with zoos and are providing livestock for show in zoos so that people can come along and just understand why we need to protect them. But then you've got to differentiate between the people who look after the animals properly and the ones who just want them for status. You know, I've got this cat. <laughs> Having one as a pet, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work because very few of these cats are friendly enough to be classed as a pet. These cats are all in good hands at the Cat Survival Trust. While the trust is focused on long-term conservation of cats in the wild, this 12-acre property at Hertfordshire, England is a haven for unwanted and surplus wild cats from zoos and other collections where cats have proven to be too much of a handful. When I was studying at uh, London University back in the 60s, I was actually working part of the time for my uncle's firm in, in aviation insurance to pay my way. And one day I went into Harrods and uh, there was a South American Margay for sale uh, for 300 pounds. And I thought about this. I thought, that's a nice cat. And for the wrong reason, to have it as a pet. And I went away and uh, got money together and three weeks later went back to buy it. But unfortunately, Lady Fisher of Kilberton Wildlife Park beat me to it. But between 66, which is when I saw this cat, and uh, 75, I accumulated so many books about wild cats and realized that you know there were 37 species of cat, not just your lions and tigers, but you know such uh, amazing cats as Pampas Cat and Andean Mountain Cat and Sand Cat and a remote cat and so on, which I'd never heard of. I mean, they weren't in the school curriculum. So I, I really got into this and felt, well, something ought to be done. And realized very quickly after a few years that sadly there wasn't a rescue operation in England to take surplus and unwanted cats. So a group of us got together and in 75 we formed the charity, basically to look after unwanted and confiscated yes. cats from illegal collections. He's getting a bit heavy to hold and he's, you've got to be careful when you're holding him. It doesn't, it's, it's uncomfortable for him. The Eurasian lynx is an interesting one. The Scandinavian, there are about two, three thousand left. The Central European, uh, two or three hundred. And the Italian, down to about 40. This is a Central European. So with two or three hundred left is not good. He's only really friendly with four of us. We used to allow people in with him, but not anymore. He picks up on the slightest element of fear and get quite aggressive. Working with these animals requires a lot of knowledge on what makes them tick. We wanted to study cats in the wild. We wanted to find some ways of perhaps preserving cats in the wild, keeping them safe in the wild. We wanted to provide a, an educational service. The first 30 years were pretty difficult, although in 92 we did manage to buy 10,000 acres of virgin forest in northeast Argentina with five species of cat living free in their own environment. And in future, we want to buy more natural habitat because keeping animals in their own environment is by far the most economic, most ethical way. And of course, to save cats, you've got to have that entire ecosystem intact. Any part of that food chain is out and the cats are going to die. There is no doubt the work that Terry and his team of volunteers do is vital to survival of many cat species. The jaguar is in danger and the work at the Cat Survival Trust is about helping animals like Athena, affectionately known as Jags. But we all know looks can be deceiving. Jaguars are only found in South and Central America. They're quite different from the leopards. They're much bigger, much chunkier, and much more dangerous. They'll take uh, crocodiles out of the uh, rivers and, and just crunch them. Give her a, a whole deer and there is nothing left. I mean, she will eat the skull, the hooves, absolutely everything. I go in with all the cats here with the exception of the jaguar and the amio leopards because 
She was already uh, an adult when she came. I didn't have the chance to build a relationship with her. And she wouldn't know her own strength. She'd want to play hard. The unpredictability of a pet in captivity is never something to be ignored. Out of all the cats we keep here, she's probably the, the most dangerous. Cats are potentially dangerous and not ideal as pets in any way. Big cats have an enormous appeal as a pet, particularly when they're young. They are playful and often have many of the enduring characteristics of a domestic cat. However, when you think what a domestic cat can do to a small mouse, you'd have to be mindful that the time may come where you could end up being the big cat's human mouse to torment and tease until your last breath is taken. Perhaps these cats are far more spectacular in the wild than in your backyard. But for these cats to roam free, a lot of work needs to be done. Keeping cats in captivity is a sort of stopgap. Let's face it, most of the wild places where you find cats are being wiped out. There's just too many humans. We, we need oil, we need minerals, we need metals. We're destroying the habitat. And so every species is seeing falling numbers every year. The way it's going, we could lose every single species, not out of cats, but everything else. Research and breeding programs are vital to save these animals. Zoos have played a major part in education, allowing people to understand why animals are important. There are some very good zoos who do a lot of conservation work. You know, they breed certain species in captivity and then release them back into the wild. For the good zoos that have lots of information, uh, lots of placards and, and uh, uh, posters all about why we have to save animals, that's great. But I think what we have to do is look really seriously at the zoos that are underfunded, that aren't looking after the animals properly, and they should be closed. So the question is, in the future, so many of these cats that have many subspecies, how relevant is it to say, right, let's save all of the different subspecies? Pumas, they're originally, they thought to be 29 subspecies. So when you've got a species like the puma, what you find is that those that are living near the equator are much smaller. Those living away from the equator are much bigger and much chunkier and, and their fur is much thicker. Sadly, because jaguar need much stronger enclosures, this is a much thicker wire than you would keep uh, any of the other cats that we have in. Uh, Zoos can't generally afford to build a huge enclosure like this with this extra cost uh, added to the wire. Uh, she's now unfortunately too old to breed and because the Jaguar stud book have said, look, if, if we breed a load, where are we going to put them? Because zoos can't afford to build this sort of enclosure anymore. So there is a restriction on breeding. Generally speaking, stud books are there to make sure that we don't get surpluses in official collections. And that's very sensible with the Jaguar because there's a fair number left in the wild, although as they destroy more and more forest, we're losing habitat at such a, an amazing rate. And ultimately, some of the subspecies could disappear. Whether you're looking at these cats thinking, I want one as a lovable purring pet, or if you feel you should get on board to help save many species of big cats, it's clear. The survival of these incredible animals is up to the human race. We've hunted to the point of extinction. We've destroyed habitats, but we can still make a difference. My number two is more than capable of taking over. We have a number of volunteers who potentially could take over in, in, in future times. And we're very lucky. We've had a lot of volunteers in the past who are, are emailing me quite frequently. Uh, are we in a position to have them back? They don't need much money, they just need enough for food and, and uh, clothing and bits and pieces. 
We're at a situation now where we know a number of our supporters have left quite substantial sums to the charity, not only to keep it going, but also to buy more natural habitat uh, in, in countries around the world. So I feel pretty happy about the current situation with the Trust. We don't have any debt here. The property is effectively owned by the charity now. I don't have any fears in the future. Too many animal collections don't think ahead. And that is one problem with people who keep exotic cats as pets. What is going to happen when they die? What is going to happen when they can't look after them anymore? But with the huge number of people who keep private collections of all sorts of animals, they really need to think this through because the only option is to put them down. And then what was the point of having them in the first place? People who keep these animals, a lot of them will have friends and relatives come and see the cats, will learn more about why the, why the cat is endangered. And that will all help towards people in the future providing funding for new projects, particularly in the wild. And certainly we found by having cats here that when we bought our 10,000 acres of forest in Argentina, people were very happy to support it because they saw the cat and they saw why we wanted to save the cat in its own habitat.